All right, here we go. Time for another episode of Golf Subpar. Well, it's another another week, Sleaze, but uh, not a surprise. World number one dominates again. Just an incredible final round from Scotty Scheffler winning back-to-back Players' Championships. The first time this has ever happened in the 50 years with a final round 64. I mean, the man started off five shots back, had a hurt neck. Was there ever any doubt? Uh, No. <laughs> I, actually, yeah, there was some doubt. I would say there was some doubt, but, like, dude, more than anything, just, like, what a week. We finally had one. You yes. know, we've been talking about where are the stars, where are the big name players. And then, you know, at the big name events, and then we get Scotty Scheffler at Bay Hill, played unbelievably. We're probably taking it for granted at this point, but like we didn't have the dramatic finish, right? It was just a runaway. It's like you could have turned that thing off on the back nine, more or less. So like Scotty ain't losing this thing. Finally, for the first time this year, we got a big event with big names and we got a dramatic finish on, without question, like the most dramatic closing holes in golf, dude. And it was, it was unbelievable. I mean, it was spectacular. You got world number one doing world number one things. You got Wyndham Clark, who's you know now top five in the world, fourth in the world golf rankings. Probably the second best player to Scotty at this point in the world right now. You got Scheffler, Wyndham, Harmon, Xander, all battling. Like, we finally got it. And it was a hell of a week. It was the most fun I've had watching golf in a long time. I watched every second of it. I mean, my hands were sweating with those guys coming down the stretch. It was one of those. Wyndham had a five five shot lead after 36 holes. And it not at one point did I ever be like, okay, this is going to be a runaway. This golf course, having played it many a times in the past, it's so hard to be a leader around there because you just know at any moment you could lose two, three shots to par. Anything can happen around there. And it's so hard to play with the lead just because you want to protect so much. But if you go out there and you play aggressive and you're on your game, like we saw Scotty Scheffler do, like we saw Xander Schauffele do on Saturday, like you can go low around there it's just it's a terrifying golf course and i think that's what makes it one of the most fun to watch all year yeah it seems to be a it's a dicey place when you got two hands on the wheel when you're playing like hey don't mess up don't mess up i got five and i'm not saying Wyndham did that but Wyndham looked on the weekend like he wasn't firing on all cylinders like he was thursday friday like he was swinging it beautifully off the tee it was incredible his putter was back to where it was like at pebble beach he was making everything and then on the weekend didn't quite have it. You see some of those high rights that he hits out there when things get under the gun, but they stay in play. Like people like the bag on. I'm like, dude, that's part of golf. It's like figuring out a shot that you can just get in play when you can't feel your hands. But I thought it was from a Wyndham perspective, impressive. Like he didn't have his best stuff on on Saturday, Sunday, yet he still had a chance to win that golf tournament all the way up to the 72nd hole. And I think if you rewind a year, a little over a year ago, like that's not the case. And when he won the U S open, like things were clicking pretty damn good. Same with quail hollow. Like he was unbeatable. And then it just, he found a way to be relevant and contend without his best stuff. But right now, like Wyndham said, uh, he's the best player in the best player in the world. Like I Scotty's mean, head and shoulders above everyone else. He's not the only one to say it. And by the way, that putt that went more than halfway under the ground was just disgusting. That was criminal. Lipped out. I was hoping for a playoff just because I didn't want the thing to end. It was that much fun sitting on the couch Watching it, got to give a huge shout out to NBC. They had a fantastic week, and our guy Johnson Wagner, MVP stole- of the week, Johnson yes. Wagner, five tool guy. Hey Johnson, we need you to get out here on seven and just hawk balls at the side of this bank as hard as you can. We're gonna need you to go out here, create the unhittable Rory McIlroy shot again, make you look like an asshole. We get you over to seven. I mean, he did everything, dude. He was unbelievable. Shout out Wagyu. As we said on SiriusXM, the price of Wagyu went up mm-hmm. after that. But it was it was a great week for everyone involved. Scotty Scheffler, I mean. What can you say? I mean, he just goes out every single... I mean, he's got a hurt neck. He's out there getting stretched on by his trainer, Marnus. Says he might not be able to continue. Decides to tough it out. Shoots three under par 69 on that Friday and then goes out. Sun- Saturday, didn't feel that great. What's he do? Just birdie 16, 17, 18. Shoots 68. There he is, five back going into Sunday. You're like, what's going to happen? Slow start, par, par, par. Well, he's probably not going to have it this week. Hoop wedge, and then here we go. Then it was on. See you later. I'm out of here. You know, like going back to that Saturday finish, the birdie, birdie, birdie. Like I know they weren't looking at it at the time, but like when Wyndham and Xander and those guys that were at the top got in, they're like, oh damn, like he's only five back. You know, I guarantee they had to look at that. But like if eight back, it's like, okay, I don't have to worry about Scotty Scheffler. That'll be nice. But he gets it to five. And then, like, yeah, when they interviewed Wyndham, hey, when was the first time you looked at the scoreboard and noticed Scotty Scheffler was up there? He's like, I didn't really look at anything until eleven. He's like, then I looked up and saw Scotty. And I was like, Well, yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course, Scotty. Like, can you give us one week where we don't have to worry about you but that's a no. testament like he's in he, he's a contemporary right now and these guys are talking about him like that you know giving him that much accolades you don't see that with currents too often it's normally like guys that are done playing like that guy was the best but they're doing that to scotty right now yeah you know i, I exchanged some texts with john rom after it and just asked if he watched 
Um, and, all, and he said, yeah, I caught the end of it. And I said, like, what do you what's your thoughts on Scott? He's like, what do you want me to say? He's incredible. Like he put on an incredible performance and the golf he's playing right now is unbelievable. Yeah, I don't think there's any de- like there's a lot of debate about different things going on in the game of golf right now. There's one that's not a debate, and that's who's the best at the sport. Mm-hmm. And it's Scotty. And he's not the loudest and doesn't give the big interviews and stuff like that. But the do- like appreciate this because I almost feel like it's getting taken for granted because he isn't tooting his own horn and he doesn't do all the loud stuff, you know, and he just goes about his business and beats everyone's head. And it's two weeks with this new putter, two weeks positive strokes gained putting. And two wins, one in a runaway, and one, you know, he wasn't even feeling 100% the entire week. It's pretty wild what he's doing. Scotty learned how to putt. Scotty Uh-oh. does know. Uh-oh. Scotty does know. Um, and I will say, listen, it's not like I went out on a limb, but when I was doing the show last week from Shadow Creek, having a time. Oh, my yeah, man, let's talk about that a little Jeremy. bit. What is my guy Andy Reid doing? Is he alive still? <laughs> that dude was... I believe he, he had, was redder than Santa Claus when he popped his little head in there. I believe he has made it back to Winnipeg. Vegas is very happy to get rid of him. But I did say Scotty Scheffler, which I mean, what a hell of yeah, a I mean, call! Hell of a call, right? God but damn! It's just it's so special to watch. But I will give a shout out to all the boys from Winnipeg. We had a blast up there. Three days at Shadow Creek is a lot. The Oxford Pro Am was so much fun. Had three perfect. The last day, the wind blew a little bit. Of course, the toughest of conditions after you just beat your body to shit for two, three nights in a row. Um, but man, it was so much fun! Can't wait to do it again. Yeah, three nights in Vegas equals two nights too many. They've already Vegas. put you down. And if for people next were texting year. me, they're like, "Yo, who is that dude that just popped his head in or pop, popped onto the podcast?" I was like, "I don't know. That's a dude from Canada that Colt was playing with, and he seemed happy as shit. Looked like a great squad you had, though. It was a lot of fun. All the boys: Dougie, Carrie, Brent, and then our MVP, our leader, Jeremy Kruger, who I found out son is named Freddie. That's coach. That's, that's Coach, coach, that's coach Yeah, I liked him. I liked him. He had good, he had good energy. Did y'all do any good in that thing? Uh, yeah. Finished? We finished. Completed? <laughs> we completed all 54 holes? It, uh, we, well we, done. we finished all 54. Like I said, it was it was awesome, man. Shadow, I mean, anytime you get to go to Shadow Creek, hang out with everybody there, Monty. Monty was driving around his cart chirping me the whole time, that trying to sound, side bet me. That shocking. doesn't sound like Monty. I know. That doesn't sound like him. I'm heading up there this weekend, actually. Oh, so boy. Here we go. Well, I don't know. Run much, it back. I don't know how much booze they have left. We'll you see, might, you we'll might see want what to we take can do. some of this Sincoro I'm going to trust you. me. And hey, subpar golfers, today we've got something extra special to talk about. A tequila that's as smooth as a perfect swing on the course. Get ready to dive into the world of Sincoro tequila. Crafted by none other than five NBA team owners turned tequila enthusiast. Picture this. Jeannie Buss of the Los Angeles Lakers. Wes Edens of the Milwaukee Bucks. Amelia Fazolari and Wick Grusbeck of the Boston Celtics. And the one and only... You might have heard of this there guy. There you go. Michael Jordan, Easy MJ, one. coming together, not for basketball, but for their love of tequila. That's the dream team behind Sincoro. These five founders are on a mission to create the gold standard in tequila. So, subpar listeners and Valspar attendees, whether you're sipping it on the green, sharing it with friends at a tournament, or presenting it as a trophy, Sincoro tequila is a toast to excellence. Cheers to the pursuit of greatness on the course and in your glass. Sincoro Tequila, an award-winning portfolio of luxury tequilas founded by five NBA team le- legends on a mission to create the most delicious tequila anyone has ever tasted. In fact, they set out to create the gold standard in tequila. Sleaze had plenty of it up there in Vegas. Mm-hmm. It is delicious, as you know. It's rich and delicious with a long, luxurious finish. If you're interested in learning more about Sincoro, the story behind the brand and its founders, you can follow them on Instagram at Sincoro or visit their website, Sincoro.com. If you'd like to give Sincoro a try for your next time on the course, you can go to Sincoro.com or your local spirits retailer to buy a bottle and give it a try. I ha- as a as an enthusiast connoisseur myself, mm-hmm, nothing mm-hmm, better mm-hmm. than Sincoro. I saw you this weekend at supper, having that with a little splash <laughs> of orange. Supper. You know what I mean? Yeah, we had a nice little supper I, I call situation. it dinner, but yeah. Yeah, I call it supper. I had a fancy supper. It was a yeah. very nice supper. I had Sincoro with an orange. Bam, all Sincoro, night. Sincoro, repo, big cube. Oh, so good. Orange big slice. cube, orange slice. It, that's all you need. No mixers, no nothing. All right, well, our guest this week, oh. in Scared of a Little Sincoro as well, you know him as the short game chef, PGA Tour winner, Parker McLaughlin, joined us on Subpar. Here he is. All right, you have probably seen our next guest on social media cooking up some saucy treats for the boys. He's a former PGA Tour winner turned short game guru, the chef, Parker McLaughlin. Long overdue. Good to have you, buddy. Dude, I mean, I see all the names up here. It's nice to uh, finally add a, my name up there. This, is, this will be yeah, good. We got You're rent. busy, man. We You're giving rent. all these lessons. You don't have time to come in here and do this little podcast. I'm waiting for you to call Get in the Kitchen. 
Oh, but you no. ever been in the I, kitchen? Uh, what I putt from any anything inside like thirty yards, I just putt it. I mean, I don't really need help with that. <laughs> just bang it up there. Yeah, a lot less can go wrong. You and every other member at Whisper Rock. Hey, man, it gets a little soft and wet in those in those collection areas. I ain't chipping. Mm-mm. Too much booze in the system. No matter how long it's been since I drank tap, I can't handle those. Yeah, the little tighties. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean it, that that that's like the exact thing, like. You know, like Pinehurst was sort of the the impetus of like when the U.S. Open started cutting rough down and shaving everything off and it's everything starts falling off into these areas, right? These collection areas and they're cut really tight and and all the water gravitates there, yeah. right? And so that's like really why some of the stuff that I've been doing on social is sort of hit because it's been like it's become a problem for everybody in golf. I mean, yeah, my courses are going to that like type yeah. of like runoffs that collects here, short, you know, tight grass, got to hit the little zippers as yep. opposed to like when you put like the old school courses, I guess, still have the rough around the green. That's the tricky stuff for me now is when I go, it's like, dude, I haven't played from rough in, in a year. Yeah. You know what I mean? I just hit the same shot over and over around here. Yeah. I have no problem with the rough. It's when I get down there in those collection areas and I can feel the ground move under my feet and I'm like, oh, dear God. Like, if I don't catch this perfect, I'm going to lay it right in front of me. I grew up in Texas where it's dormant Bermuda. It's firm and like you actually like, use the bounce or actually if you want to use the leading edge you can and it just i think a lot of people think it's easier to chip out here in scottsdale on the overseed and i actually found out my my chipping got worse when i moved out here yeah Uh, i mean you're not you're not alone right i mean it depends on where you grow up i think that people that you know grow up in texas right they 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 understand how to play out of you know that into the grain bermuda grass and if they move here they they probably feel like it's easier sometimes Mm -hmm. but um boy you get that newly that that new overseed rye grass and it's soft. It's like no, no thing. I mean, it's it's like it's better just, than that burnt out Bermuda, like laying into you with a little bit wet. Like, it's a little bit muddy underneath. I'm like, I'm gonna put this behind my back foot and just slam that. Like that's all. And I have yeah. no. It's just like get it up there somewhere close. Whereas on the rye stuff, I'm like, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, but I'm <laughs> just saying. You know, it's totally, I mean? totally different. different. Because so for me, it's like, oh, this is into the grain in Bermuda. I'll just stab it, just dig that leading edge of the ground and just pop it. Like we saw Min Woo Lee do. Yeah, he got a nice. Took a. I mean, his club was just not even stopping. I'm like, oh, I know that shot. And like, we we used to play bump and runs and stuff in Texas. And here with the overseed, you try to drill it into a slope, it just plugs and comes right back at you. So how do I how do I fix that? Yeah, I mean, are we on the clock right now? Yeah, I mean, pro bono. This is pro bono work. Well, that's the thing. It's like there's a recipe for all these different kinds of shots, right? And sort of like, um, that's sort of where like the name sort of came from. Is like there's a there's a recipe and, and ingredients for all these different shots around the green. Uh, it's not just like, oh, just hit your stock one. It's like, no, you got to have all kinds of different shots to be able to handle these different lies with different upslopes and different downslopes and different grass and hit it high with some spin, hit it low with some spin. You got to have all those all those types of shots. So I, I sat with Roger Cleveland when we were in L.A. a couple weeks ago. I mean, he's legend, obviously legend. one of the greatest wedge designers there's ever been. And I was kind of telling him, like, some of the shots I've been struggling with. And he's like, oh, hold on. He went over and he just built me a wedge, which I'm very lucky that that's I'm able to do that. But for the people listening at home, like, should they have a different wedge, like, depending on where they're from, where they play most of their golf in the certain conditions? Oh, absolutely. Um, it starts, I think there's there's two factors that go into it. Number one would be, like, your normal attack angle. How are you delivering the club? Are you someone that's steep and holding on? Or are you someone that releases it too early? Um, and then the second factor is, where are you playing? Are you playing most of your golf in Seattle or most of your golf in Midland, Texas? Those are two massively different turf conditions that you got to account for. So between those two things is how you should start to pick your wedge. All right, so, I mean, I know it's obviously there's a lot that goes into it, but say you're a Bermuda guy, more firm conditions compared to a lush overseed. Like what should be the difference in the bounce in your wedges? Well, if there's more give, you want to go with a little more bounce, mm-hmm. right? You want that, that bounce is going to help push you and, and sort of like help keep you surfing on top of the grass. That's sort of how you would, you would imagine bounce to, to work. And so if you're in those like Seattle, Poana kind of conditions, like you want that bounce to kind of keep you up up above that ground. Whereas if you're in that firm, you know, Midland, Texas, anywhere in kind of that Texas area, you're going to want this thing. If you're going to lay a, a, a blade open, like it's if it's sitting on this table right here, if you lay that blade open, if you got 12, 14 degrees of bounce, it's going to sit way up and it's going to look really bad. So you want something with less bounce for those type of firmer, like, you know, you go over to Scotland, you play firmer conditions over there, you know, in the summertime, yeah. right? You're going to want something that's going to sit flat like that to the ground. Like a putter. <laughs> a putter works, <laughs> man. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're giving your lessons online and people are, you know, 
sending you videos from Florida and then the next dude's in a Seattle or whatever. You got to like, it's not like there's one technique because I see some of the online stuff and we'll get into that like versus the steep versus the shallow and stuff like that. And my whole thing was like, yeah, dude, it totally, the shot I hit it out here in Arizona off this rye where I can make it zip, like I can't hit that down there off of certain lies in Florida. So you have to like tweak the way you teach based on conditions, don't you? It's not yeah, like a one, yeah, it's one size fits all. Yeah, I would say that most people are looking for, like that's the nuanced part of it, right? But most people are looking for something that they can like just trust. Blanket, yeah. Yeah, like, hey, just give me something that I can trust under the gun, right? Like that's what most people are looking for. And whether you're playing for your club championship or playing a high school match or whatever it is, someone's you're playing for five bucks against your buddies. You're looking for something you can trust from 5, 10, 15, 20 feet, 30 feet off the green. And so that's what I'm I'm doing most of my stuff with that, right? Once you get past that, you start getting into the more nuanced stuff. That's when you start figuring out, okay, well, hey, have you tried a little lower lock? Okay. Have you tried a little draw path? Have you tried to open the face up and, and tried a little cut That's path? more like 202, 303 levels. Exactly. Stuff, as opposed to like people are like, I can't chip on the yep. green. Get me on the green. Yeah, I usually help build people their foundation. And then once they've got their foundation built, then we can start to get creative off of that foundation. But you got to have the foundation built. Because if your foundation is all over the map, like, hey, let's get steep and cutty then all of a sudden you you don't really have the ability to hit like a, a low one back to a back pin with a little draw. So you got to start with something that's sort of like neutral. I call it the like the vanilla pitch shot. You got to start with something that's a little bit neutral and then work towards like getting creative off of that, off of that neutral. Yeah. Take, take the average golfer, not any of the tour players you work with. What's the most common mistake in the short game you see the average player make? Uh, they just don't move their body. They, they think it's like a short shot. It should just be like a short swing. And so it becomes very like handsy, armsy, like nothing moves. And the second that they just get this club like super vertical in the backswing, they're done because they haven't pivoted at all. So usually that's that. And, and they reach for the 60 degree like way too often when it's like you would be much better off trying to hit a nine iron here. Um, but nobody practices that. And they see the guys on TV using 60 degree every t every shot around the green. But it's like, these guys are practicing nine hours a day. Like yeah. they're using one club because they're good at it and they've practiced it. Um, I, I think for the amateur golfer, like taking less loft is always a good option. Um, but also you gotta move, you gotta use your body. You gotta move. This is great. Parker thinks we're actually recording an episode. We're just getting a free <laughs> lesson right this now. a free lesson. <laughs> yes, this is fantastic. Keep, keep going. Uh, all right. so. For the people listening out there who aren't familiar, give us some of the tour pros you work with. And now he asked about the amateur side. On the tour side, when guys reach out to you, what is it that they're typically looking for? Obviously, they want to get better with their short games, but it's like, I can't hit this certain shot or my bunker game. Or like, is there a common theme amongst the pros that you deal with? Yeah. I mean, I think with most pros, they're obviously all, all pretty good once they come to me. Um, but when you when you start looking at like individual cases, like Colin Morikawa came to me last offseason looking to perfect well, he was like, I haven't really actually had a short game lesson, right? So he was looking to just kind of get an overall viewpoint of like because he never misses a green. Yeah, he does yeah. exactly he right. Right, once like, a day. He he doesn't need to. Yeah. He doesn't need to practice that much. So um, he just wanted he wanted like, hey, where do I start? And so I gave him I gave him some things. We worked um, we worked really hard on on just getting him like a standard pitch shot, understanding how to use the bounce, um, understanding what width and and shallowness and and all this stuff meant. Um, and, and just took a comprehensive look at where he was with his, with his short game. Um, but yeah, like, you know, a, a good example would be Tom Kim a couple weeks ago at, at the waste management. He came and said, look, I can only hit a low spinner. I need to learn how to hit from a little low area up higher and still have it grab. I can't hit that shot. It's either the low spinner or the high flop shot. And so, and so we get diving into how to do that. Right. So it's, it's a specific type of a shot that he was looking for. Um, and it was cool. And it was cool to see like that particular week on Friday on 14, he gets up right, um, just the pins front, right. And he misses it short, right in the fairway, no real green to work with. Got to go uphill. And he chips this thing in, flies it onto the green bounce, bounce, check and trickles in the hole, goes on to make the cut on the number. And, and that shot was kind of a difference maker to, to making the cut or, or not making the cut. So cool to see stuff like that. Um, with with high level players, right? Um, but my, you know, my whole goal with with doing this has always been to get the the information that the PGA Tour players know and instinctively know, 
and get that information to the amateurs because the tour players make it look so easy. They make it um, seem like it's very easy, but they're also stacking the odds in their favor, right? They're using the bounce when when appropriate. And, and the amateur golfer, you know, unfortunately makes makes golf way harder than it needs to be. And so my whole goal with starting Short Game Chef was to basically be like, I want to give the amateurs the best chance of success around the greens and help them to sort of modernize their short game with with some of these techniques that that I've learned over the years of playing on tour. Yeah, yeah. the rich amateurs pay way better than the tour pros. Yeah, but don't, <laughs> as a teacher, mics are off right now. Is there ever an incentive like, I don't want to make this guy super good or else he stops coming back to me? It's like a doctor. Like, I don't want to fix you all the way or else you're not a customer anymore. You know what I mean? Like, just keep giving them little nibbles, but be like, you're almost there, but you're not there. I'll see you tomorrow. Doctors are legally allowed to do that. I think this that, might be a I think you'd be surprised. <laughs> I think you'd be surprised. Yeah, I've taken the opposite approach. Like, I want to make my guys autonomous, right? It's it's a terrible business model. Then you're out of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, a terrible business model. But I want to make my guys, especially my top guys, I want to make them autonomous. I want to make them like have ownership of their game, ownership of their short game, because on Sundays when they're choking their guts out and they can't swallow uh, on Sunday walking, I don't want them to have to look outside the ropes and be like, what shot am I supposed to hit here? I want them to know and like understand like, yeah, I own this shot. I've worked on it. I own, I understand what I'm, what I'm trying to do here. So I weirdly enough, I want them to own it and not actually have to use me. That's a good answer. That's a good answer on the mic. We'll talk off, man. I'm fascinated to hear this because I know a lot of our listeners struggle and they, they have the chipping yips. We see it every day up at West Brock. We're not going to mention any names of any directors of golf or anything like that. No, no, no. We're going to talk about that at all. They're directors. Too. Yes. But I think the, the biggest question is, can chipping yips be cured? In, do you, in your opinion, because... And I know it was a show, but I remember when Barkley went on Haney's show and all this, and he kept saying, he doesn't have the yips. It's not a mind problem. It's a technique problem, which the dude was frozen on the way down. So I don't agree with that. But do you think the yips are more of a technique problem or more of a mind problem? And can you fix them? That's a, I mean, I think that's a really good question. McCord and I have actually had a lot of good conversations on this. McCord is taking a deep dive into the mental side of the yips, right? He's just fascinated by it. I've taken a deep dive into the the technical side of the yips. Um, I think at the end of the day, it's it's a it's a combination of both, but it also depends on how long has that person been in that chipping yip state where they're just frozen, they're they're fearful, right? Um, I've had some people that have come to me, let's say like division one golfers that have been like, I'm stuck. I, I've been yipping it for the last six months, eight months, t- 12 months, whatever it's been. And with a couple of technique changes and philosophy changes, all of a sudden they're chipping it awesome. But they don't have the same amount of scar tissue as someone that comes to me that says, I've been in this for 12 years. I finally found your stuff. And now, like, I feel like I'm making progress, but I'm like, we spent two, three hours. And it's like, but they they were way better than when they started. But you can see it still present itself every now and again where they flinch or they just sort of have that that little moment of like, oh, I'm scared of the ground and they yip it. Um, that person, it, it, it takes the mental work as well. So it's, it's a combination of both. But... I mean, I've seen, I've, I've helped probably over a hundred people out of the chipping yips. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, probably 50 in person and 50 have gone through my online cure the yips program. And it's like, they've sent notes like, dude, I've had the yips for a while. And with your program, it's, it's gone. My wife is so happy. I'm happier at home now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no longer my dog no longer has broken ribs every day. It makes people like cry, dude, when oh they fix that. I've seen, I got an old uh, buddy, his old friend. Had it for, dude, I don't know how long, like one-handed, then just went to the putter, then went to like just eight iron, bounce it onto the green type of stuff. And like he, whatever he did this a while back, got fixed. And like, he was like literally in tears when he would hit like a chip to three feet. Like, yeah. dude, I haven't been able to do that in 10 years. Yeah. I have a, I have a guy, I had a guy, Bryce Mulder, um, got this guy to come to me. And Bryce is like, this is, this guy has the worst <laughs> chipping. I don't mean to laugh. It's just, I can see no, Bryce explaining this. No. Yeah. And so Bryce drew up a contract um, for this guy. He says, look, if Parker can fix you, you will pay Parker 10% of everything you make. I'm not going to mention the the notorious LA club that he's uh, a member at, but Bryce said, look, if, if Parker fixes you, you're paying him 10% of everything. And so sure enough, I get Venmos from this guy, like, 50 bucks. He's just like had a great day at the course, chipped it close a bunch of times. Beautiful. And what a just, guy. I mean, yeah, no, it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, but but anyway, like it's it's pretty fun to see these people like exit out of 
being so fearful of something and then actually feeling like, oh, I'm if they can if they can get great at it, they'll actually want to be like, oh, I want to show off. Mm -hmm. But I would say if if we can get them out of the the yips part of it and the fearful part of it and get them into serviceable, like that's a huge win. It just amazes me, like I mean, how fast it can happen. Yeah. I mean, you see guys like I mean, Graham Dillette was so open about it when it happened to him. I mean, one of the best ball strikers on the PGA tour had a great career out there, and then all of a sudden one day just got the flinches yep. and literally couldn't play. I mean, he withdrew from Memorial and he he put it out there on social media. He's like, look, I'm struggling with the chip and yips. I'm going to try to go figure this out. Yeah, we and saw it basically Tiger. ruined his career. Yeah, we saw yeah. Tiger deal with it here in Phoenix yeah. too, right? I yeah, mean, it's he like, got it real quick. Yeah, yeah. All it, it takes is Brock like one McKenzie, weird one. It's yes. always the greatest ball strikers yeah. too. Like you never see the guy, probably because you're hitting 16 greens, you only chip twice. Like your right. technique's probably not as good as the guy missing 12 greens around. But like Brock McKenzie, I would yeah. go back to like that guy – to this day, one of the best pure ball strikers hitting it out of the middle of the face that I've ever been around. I think he led the Corn Ferry Tour uh, in greens and regulation in his last year and lost his cart. Yep. He was because he could not putt or yeah. like he was putting and chipping. Yeah, then he went to the one-handed. Yeah. He could still win like mini tour events chipping one-handed because he literally <laughs> chipped once per round, but it yeah. seems like it's always the great ball strikers. It is. It really is. And I was, I was the opposite of that. I'm sure you guys looked up some of my stats, but I was like, I probably averaged like, nine greens around and i was like well, okay that's nine opportunities to try to chip in that's wanna, the way i looked at it i just want to thank you for thinking we do homework on this show <laughs> that was nice i actually do have a little homework but i believe this is correct when you won in reno uh the, i think you had a huge cushion by the way uh, shot 74 huge. the last round and one by seven but anyways you hit one green on the front shot level yes like dude you could easily you, normal bad chippers could yep. shoot, you could shoot seven over yeah I, I was, yeah eight like, for, have a freak out you know, eight for eight and up and downs yeah one um, green yeah. 36 put it on cruise control yeah. like yeah, it was the it was the worst ball striking round of of like any winner for like I think it was probably like ten years and then I think Ricky Fowler maybe a year and a half ago or a couple years ago in, in Phoenix was like that's when he like had that really bad round but it was terrible weather and all that stuff yeah, it was but raining my round was like it it was like, like that. the worst ball striking round by a tour winner for like ten years uh, did nice you, I mean <laughs> yeah. I got it then won by a million that's by great. the way yeah. All right, before we get back to our interview, a quick break to tell you that if you haven't done it yet, go check out our YouTube page. It's golf underscore subpar. We got some new content coming up uh, at the ASU facility. We're going to have some more stuff coming out as the year goes on. So if you haven't yet, go to YouTube, subscribe, golf underscore subpar. And now back to our interview. I think all of us as, as players, you never really have a plan B, right? Like you think you're just going to play golf forever, right off into the sunset, things are going to be great. At what point did you ever think, okay, coaching could be in my future? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Look, my dad was a coach. My brother, my dad was like a legendary coach, coached like Obama, a bunch of high school championships uh, in volleyball and basketball. My brother coaches over at uh, USC women's volleyball. Like it's kind of a little bit in the genes. I think the communication part of it is in the genes. I never really thought about being a coach, but um, as I – as I started playing like sort of worse and worse, I would still get into a handful of tournaments, but then it was like, um, okay, well I'm playing five weeks a year. What am I doing the other 47 weeks? Uh, I dabbled in a little bit of commentating, uh, which was, which was fun, but I couldn't really see myself, um, just turning on the, the bullshit factor for, you know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't be Charlie Reimer. Like that's just not my personality. Um, and Charlie's great at doing that, but I'm, that's just not my personality. Um, uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, a caddy friend of mine, Doug Schwimmer, he was like, yo, you need to, your short game's so good. Like you should put out some tips for people to like get better. And that's sort of where short game chef was born. And then two days after I put that on social media, Kevin Streelman called and he was like, Hey, I see you're doing some short game instructing. Like, can I spend a couple hours with you? And that's when this whole thing like really started. And I'm like, all right, my the first paid lesson I'm giving is to the guy ranked 93rd in the world. I'd never given a short game lesson before. And so I was like, well, I got to figure this out. Um, but that's that's sort of how it started. And then Kevin had told a bunch of Whisper Rock members and they started coming to see me. And um, and then word sort of started organically spreading. Is it? Trails has gone through more golf instructors than the Kardashians have not, plastic surgeons. It's not a uh, all, yeah. lack of information <laughs> for Streels. He's got it all. Is it hard? Like I've transitioned transitioned out of golf. He's done it. You've done it. Like swallowing your pride and being like, okay, I'm no longer a player. Like I'm not trying to beat these guys anymore. And you kind of have to accept that. Like I'm on the other side now. Is that was that a hard thing to do? To be like, uh, okay, well, I'm yeah. a teacher now instead yeah, one, of a player. You've been a player percent. your whole life. One million percent. I mean, a lot of, lot of like, uh, 
you know, like, uh, you know, just long conversations with the wife and like figuring out like, where is our path in, going in this, in this whole life, right? You always think of yourself as a player and you just sort of have that like dog mentality. Like I got to yeah. beat this guy and this guy. And I always played that way. I, I, I would pro I probably played angry, right? Like I was like, I, I always had a chip on my shoulder. Um, like I, like Ches Reeby, right? Like he was always sort of like we we played a lot of college golf together, and he was like we were all we'd always have this sort of like friction between the two of us. And a couple of years ago, he reaches out and he's like, "Yo, I want to spend some time together." And I told my wife, I was like, "Yeah, I'm gonna go work with Ches," and she's like, "Ches used to be like you, like you guys used to battle, and now you're like helping him." I was like, "Yeah, it's like a, it's like a whole different like thing." And like and I look at it, and I I went I randomly was looking at his stats and like. He's like 23rd in strokes gain around the green this year, right? It's like he's done really well with the information that I've given him. And I'm super stoked on it. And we've developed this like great relationship that's not sort of like, I want to beat you and I want to yeah. beat you. But it's become a really neat, uh, a neat relationship that I really value. But um, yeah, it's 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 different, like to put on that different hat. Um, and I'll like I, I separate it, I'll dress differently to just sort of think about like when I go coach. Like I'll dress differently than I would if I was actually going to play in a tour event. Well, Chess shot sixty today playing with me. So did he chip? I hope, though? I hope he took all your money. Did he chip? Uh, he was my partner, and we cleaned up. <laughs> no, you got it done with the sixty piece. I got, I, I, I cut him five shots. Everything was good. Well, that's nice. Yeah. That's I mean, that's we, a damn good. This is a good part. We had a we had a nice little we net up nicely. Net fifty five. We shot uh, net seventeen under. Yes. I got, get it I got one aside, get it birdied one of my stroke holes, and part of the other. So, yeah, I chipped in. I threw in a couple birdies for him. Hello. I mean, you just sit back and watch. Do we need, is that a, hey, is that I got a jar? Pocket, is that a 20? I got a pocket full of money. Twomps in there to this self-suck brand new We need one of to just dap yourself yeah. up as much as you want. You just got to slide a couple slide twomps a couple in here. Yeah. For the kids at the end of the year, <laughs> by the way. Give me, uh, but to answer your question, did he chip? He hit two chips from what I can remember. I bet one, he got up and down. Par five, he missed like a six footer for birdie. Would have been 59. And he got the other one up and down from short of the green on the fourth. You all know the lower. Yep. Okay. Other than that, I don't think he chipped. Yeah. So time I mean, to start topping. When you make 12 him. tweets, you don't really chip much. How good is that? He did that same thing in the the pro scratch deal that we had at the Rocky. He shot a million. He won the thing by himself, which is pretty damn impressive given mm -hmm. those. And then we went and just hyped the shit out of him on the show. And then it went to Hawaii and like he played. <laughs> It was like shot like four <laughs> over the first day. Like, I know. God damn. And this is going to be interesting because I don't yeah. know when this is going to come out, but next week is the Players' Championship, which is a perfect golf course for him. And I played with him two days in a row. Stripe up, uh, shot like three or four under, I think, the first day from all the way back. Today was the hump day game. He got 60 points, smashed his quota, shoot 60, wow. and finished second <laughs> oh. <laughs> because we got some uh, interesting quotas up there mm. at the Rock. Kyle Loesch, come yeah. on down. Kyle's earned it, I feel like. He's had a lot of days not not cashing but no. so to get one yeah the game coming back the game looks nice for chess yeah. shockingly yeah i believe that. that's cool you're helping him out though give me this this is kind of putting you on the spot and stuff but if i was to say your favorite professional golfer don't even have to be pj tour around the greens and then your favorite putting stroke uh so i mean yeah i mean i would say there's there's a handful i think jordan spieth is pretty sensational he goes like steep shallow he, he's got all the shots and and i don't think he necessarily thinks about it i don't think he consciously thinks about what shot he's going to hit i think he lets the shot sort of speak to him mm -hmm. and he just goes into this other place where where it's just it, it, it's mind-blowing I, I remember doing a, a pga tour live and we were following him at hilton head on saturday sunday and and we watched every shot he hit and it was like this guy he holed out two bunker shots chipped in another time like Dude, it's it's, and every shot was like very different. It wasn't the same. It was like, so he's he's like on another level. I think Cam Smith is incredible. Um, you know, I, I think that you know, like, uh, yeah, I, I think that there's there's a lot of great short games. Guys do it a lot of different ways. Um, I'd say, you know, like some of the players that I've worked with the longest, like a uh, Anna Nordquist, a uh, Keith Mitchell. Like I, I appreciate where where we started and, and where we've mm -hmm. gone and, and seeing the the path that both of those players have have gone on um and those are like two of the sort of proudest things that i've sort of been a part of um and greatest putting stroke um i mean you're right up there like you got you got some you got some great tempo like natural tempo in your stroke um but i would say 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think Spieth, and I've gotten a chance to spend a lot of time with Ben Crenshaw mm -hmm. and, and watching him putt it. It's like in person, it's like a different level of drippy, right? Yeah. Like everything just drips. It's like, and the way that he describes it, um, he's got this really, really light putter, this 8802 that's so light and the shaft is really light. And it's the same one that he's used to win to win the Masters. And, and you feel this putter and it's just like, ungodly light and he says he says parker when i putt my best it feels like it's so heavy really that's and cool. i'm like well i mean you gotta be like so, like so soft in the arms and soft in the hands that's one of his biggest things he's always been he's like how like on a scale of one to ten how how tight do you grip and he's like negative four yeah and he's like i don't even feel like i'm holding on and it just swings yeah and i've spent time with faxon too and faxon is like on that next level when it comes to putting it's just like mind-blowing how how he he can he grips the putter in a way where it's not gonna, it, it's very movable, but it's not movable this way. Do you do you spend much time with people on their putting, or is it mostly just sh short game? Uh, no, I think that that's like that's kind of like a sneaky part because like I'm sure you guys did your research as far as <laughs> my putting stats. My putting stats were really good, um, and I was always a great I was always a great putter, but I always did it through my setup and my routine. I never I never really thought about my stroke. Um, so when people feel like they're in a good spot with their putting stroke, they come to me and I get them in a, in a good setup and a good routine and they start making putts. So um, you went a million yeah. holes without three putting or yeah, like yeah, 350 yeah. or some shit like yeah. that, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah 350 something. something holes without, without three putting, which is like That's a 20, good 20 rounds in a row on tour. Yeah. It was a good stretch. Um, but I, yeah, I just, I never, I didn't three putt very often. I was always like. I always made everything inside of six feet and my lag putting was pretty good. Cause again, I didn't think about my stroke that much. I was like, I dove so deep into routine and how my routine would get me into a flow state. And, and I did this, I did the same thing, like shooting free throws with basketball. It was like bounce. I would bounce, set, go. It was like very like natural. Yeah. I think that's the best way that people do anything, whether it's putting, chipping, shooting, whatever. It's like the ones that look great. They're like, you're not thinking about technique. It's other guys that like have to, you know, tuck in the sleeves and do all this. And I'm like, dude, he's thinking about 17 things. Yeah. Like it just looks different and he might be okay at it. it. might be good at it, but it's different than like a watching a Jordan speed chips. Like, dude, he's not thinking. He's just thinking about like how the shot comes out. Totally. Not any technique stuff. Yeah. And that's why Jordan started, you know, on those inside five footers. He's like, man, he looks at the hole. It's like point and shoot. That's why I think he's so I don't good. Know if he ever stop. Unlike Link stuff. I know he yeah. goes back to it every once in a while. But yeah. When his full swing gets like that, that's when he's like at his back, which I think like Link's golf brings that out. When you get wind and something, all of a sudden you're like, dude, how do I, how do I just get the ball where exactly. I want it to go? And to stop thinking about stop technique. Thinking like, about yeah, stop yeah, all the rehearsals. Here. And yeah. like, that's when he's like incredible to watch, yeah. in my opinion. All yeah. right. Here's one for you. Okay. Best player in the world right now, Scotty Scheffler, gives you a call. Says, look, obviously I'm struggling with my putting. I mean, his ball striking is so far ahead of everybody else. It's ridiculous. If he puts even just a little below average for to the field each week. Yeah. He, he's he's winning the golf tournament. What do you say to Scotty Scheffler? I, I wouldn't do anything putting stroke wise. Yeah, I would. I would go. I would find a like where he was most comfortable in setup, like junior golf. Like I would look at that kind of stuff, and then I would say let's build let's build a routine that you can trust and that gets you in a flow state, and that you don't even have to. You're not even thinking about your stroke because I guarantee you he's thinking about his stroke. He's thinking about. He's watching it on the way back, like, oh, this is too far outside. I've been working on inside, and then all of a sudden, you've, he's missed the putt. So I would, I would just go straight to like comfortable setup, like something that he did as a junior golfer, because I'm sure he made putts as a junior golfer. Yeah, he won 92 times. Yeah, and, <laughs> Lost and then a I couple, would, though. yeah, and then I would go, and then I would just go to, I'd build a routine that's like just straight out of like, look, we're gonna, we're gonna get you to the 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 spot where you can point and shoot and think the least, activate the right side of your brain turn off the left side of your brain because right now he's he's got so much left side of the brain that's that's engaged that he can't he can't make a fluid flowing stroke it's funny you say that because i've known the kid since he was six years old and like the golf swing for the most part looks pretty it's similar fun. like his setup i mean the left shoulder is a little higher than the right and that's how he used to putt when he was 10 years old yep. and i mean he would wear our ass out in putting contests when he was 10 years old and just i mean one look at the whole bam bang it right in the back it was it was impressive to see, and it's just it's so crazy to watch him now because he's obviously got great hands. When you watch him swing the golf club, like he saves the golf club so much. I mean, he falls all over the place and hits better iron shots than anybody on the planet. And his short game's pretty great too. Oh, his short yeah. game's great. Short game's it's incredible, just, and his yeah. ball striking just looks like natural. Like, that's not something you would teach. Like a teacher's like, do this with your feet. 
get the club this vertical and all this type of stuff. But like, it's natural and he does it. And I think so many people, and this isn't about Scotty's putting, but like just in general golfers, more people are ruined with like over technique, over teaching. I mean, shit, you went through it yep. a little bit after your win in Reno, right? Like changed up your stuff. And it's yep. like, you can you can paralyze the guy way more quicker. And it's like, dude, this guy got here because he knows how to golf. Like don't strip away what, what got him here. And I think there's a lot of teachers out there that do that probably inadvertently, obviously, but, yeah. but still do it so where I, their brain just gets clogged. Yeah, I mean, you know, Faxon tells a great story when he first started working with Rory. The first thing they did was he, he gave Rory a five wood and said, I want you to hit couple 15 yeah. footers with this thing and and he said rory made it was he said it was blown like 30 and the greens were 13 at the bears club and rory made three in a row from 15 feet with a five wood mm. it was like now if i gave you your putter wouldn't you be starting to think about all these different things it's like yeah you would but with a five wood you're just sort of like how do i get it in i'm just gonna figure out a way to get in the hole yeah. and not look like a fool right and just like figure it out and so i just think i think sometimes you just get you you, you get paralyzed you start thinking too much about stroke. Am I optimizing everything with like how the ball is rolling and all this stuff? It's like, it doesn't matter. You need something that you can trust and something that you can do. Like, you know, Scotty seems like a right brain kind of a guy, like an athlete. You got to, I got to get him back to being it. If I was, if I was helping him with his putting, I would want to get him back to being an athlete with his putting stroke. It's what you said that about the five with like Randy Smith, who works with Scotty, who I grew up working with. I mean, we would go out and grab a 54 degree or 60 and practice a lot of putting with yeah. that. Because you don't really think about your stroke. You're just, how do I hit this ball solid? Because you got to hit it right in the equator to get it to roll properly. And all other thoughts go out go out just the window. Little, it's just like, okay, yeah. I got to make solid contact. That and little extra focus, right? Yeah. Of like, oh, I got if I don't hit it on the equator, I'm hitting it below, it's going three feet. Yeah. Or if I hit it too much, it's jumping. It. Yeah. yeah. So like, and the, your only focus is that. You're not thinking about like, oh, I got to make sure this thing's two degrees yeah. on the inside. And you're not thinking anything. Like trying to draw a putt or anything like that. Yeah. No. Yeah, it's like Scotty's kind of like his golf looks athletic and his putting looks like kind of like a little more rigid, I would say, mm -hmm. than it used to. And I would say the same thing with like Jordan. Jordan's short game looks like the most natural thing. He's like, just give me the club. I'll make this work. And then when he gets like full, all the rehearsals and stuff, it's like his brain gets clear. Yeah, it's and, the guys that line up with that. But that's, of course, all, it's like, you know, the other stuff that. comes easy to them. Yeah. Right. Like for you yeah. and I, like hitting it, like Scotty, like not even in the realm of possibility. So we work on that stuff for him. It's just like. That's yeah. easy. It's the same way with putting with guys. Yeah, and it's like you, you wherever you're deficient, you're trying to like improve, right? So yeah. he's he's deficient in putting, and so he's just like, how do I improve this? Like, oh, I got to work on my technique. It's like, okay, you work on the technique to some point. Once you hit that spot, then it's like, all right, need to turn that off. Need to get back to being an athlete. My technique is already better, but it's hard to then turn turn that part of it off. And I I went yeah. through it with full Big swing time. and everybody's gone through right like it, it's just it's sort so of like, hard to go back it's so hard to go that. back and be like let me turn all that off and let's just get back to playing golf yeah it, it's so funny. i remember watching him at a tournament earlier this year him and sam burns one of his best buddies just get on the putting green having a putting contest there's no lining it up no looking at it from both sides it's just oh look there's right edge boom strikes makes everything <laughs> but it's so hard to make yourself do that in a tournament when everything's on the line it's like oh i'm just gonna get up there and hit this one yeah yeah, just Even don't care. It does work for him because it, his brain gets turned off. Yeah, totally. It's interesting stuff. I mean, this thing, I mean, yours is huge, so it's very I powerful. I think of all the shit I got yeah. going on. It's amazing <laughs> I can put the club on the ball, dude, yeah. with all this stuff. You wouldn't even believe if they had a transcript of what's going on in my shit when I'm standing <laughs> over the ball. Most of the time, it's not even about golf. It's, it's terrifying. Yeah. Honestly, I'll tell you this. One of the coolest, I would say, lessons slash experiences, if you want to call it that, was when you and I went down and we spent a couple of days with Zinger down in Florida, like basically short game boot camp, played golf and did all that stuff. I learned so much about, for me, my problem was always Bermuda. Like, dude, I'm terrible. I'm good out here. And then I go to Southeast and I can't get up and down from anywhere. But is is Zinger that guy you would say like your mentor, if like all teachers kind of have a guy that they take from and then build on, is Zinger that guy for you? Yeah, oh my gosh. Uh, I was in, yeah, I mean, I was kind of in a dark place with my golf game in general, kind of around 2011, 2012. And I was ready to just sort of quit the game. And Zinger, I've known him since I was probably 16 years old. And uh, like he would always come, he would come to the Sony Open like a week early. And so the pro that I was, that, that taught me the game, Greg Nichols, he was close with Paul. And so he's like, hey, come play nine holes with Paul the week before. And so we, I just, every couple of years, we'd sort of play nine holes together. And so I, I just kind of got to know him a bit. And then um, I make it on tour and he was sort of, he was Ryder Cup captain 
I think that it was like in 08, yeah. he was Ryder Cup captain. And I, I had made it on tour in 07 was my first year. And then 08, I went back to Q school and I got my card again. And and I was on the city city program and, and Zinger was like our mentor, right? And he was the captain and he was mentoring all of us sort of rookies. And, um, and so we got to spend a bit more time then. And then I lost my card in like 11. And so I was in a deep, dark place. And, and I told this guy, Greg Nichols from Hawaii, I said, look, I think I'm ready to give up the game. I, I'm hitting it 90 right and 50 left. It's, this is not conducive for playing good golf and, and trying to play professionally. And so uh, he said, let me, he said, Zinger's in town, come have lunch. And, and Zinger was in Hawaii for an outing and we went and had lunch and I was like three hour lunch and I'm in tears. And I'm like, I'm going to give up on playing this game. And Zinger's like, come back to, come back to Florida, spend a week with me. I think I can like declutter all the cobwebs that are going on in your brain. So I went back there. It was great. And, and um, it, it wasn't perfect after that, but I kept going back. And so every probably four or five months, I'd go back and I'd spend a week in Florida and, um, and stay at Zinger's house. And we'd, we would drive out to the golf course. He, at the time when I first showed up, he didn't own a car, right? He had 12 motorcycles in his garage, Jesus. but did not own a car. So he's like, hey, we're going out to the golf course. So I would I'd get, I, he said, you're driving. And I was like, what do you mean? I, I got a shitty rental car. He's like, no, no, you're driving. I just got, I got these 12 motorcycles. You can hop on the back with <laughs> yeah. me. I was like, yeah. uh, so I'm, so I'm driving. He's got a set at Gator Creek and a set um, of golf clubs at concession. And he, we get out, we drive out there and, and we just talk, right? Like, we're just, we're like, it was sort of like, you know, like I would imagine like the Tuesdays with Maury, right? Like that book, right? This was sort of like, these drives, it was like a 45 minute drive out to the golf course. She didn't live close to a golf course. And, and we would just talk about Ryder cup, mental, like, you know, all this sports psychology, breathing, all these different things. Um, we talked about his can like all this stuff where he was like, man, I had 12 top threes leading in, in, in a 12 month span leading up to when he had cancer in his shoulder. And he's like, dude, I was one of the best players on the planet, but nobody really knows. Cause then I had cancer and then I was like a totally different person. Like the guy is, you know, he he became like an unbelievable mentor and friend and like took me under his wing for like seven years. I did this. I went back to his house to try to get out of the dark place that I was in. And and he really, really helped me out of this place. Like it was like golf and life. He really helped me out. Um, but I learned a lot about the short game, tons about the short game. My short game was great. Like I was always a great short game player, but I learned even more watching him asking questions um, he, this guy had like one of the most incredible minds and figured it out, dug it out of the dirt and sort of, ch he, he would never, it was like, he checked things off the list of like, all right, I'm going to try to go like super steep here with this club face and this handle. And, and then it would be like, that didn't work. Let me check that off the list. Okay. Let me go to the next iteration of it. And he just like, he went through all these things and like the guy's one of the smartest golf IQs that I've ever been around. Um, and I actually asked, I actually, I asked Phil Mickelson, I said, Hey, I've been hanging out with, with, uh, I think it was at like a dinner at Whisper Rock. Actually, he was up there and we were talking and I was like, I've been hanging out with Zinger. I was like, well, you know, what do you think about him? He's like top three golf IQs of all time. Mm. And I was like, that's a big compliment from yeah. Phil. Right. Um, he, he's obviously one. <laughs> well, I thought he was <laughs> one, two, and three, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I just think like he, you know, he, he was a, an unbelievable mentor to me, but I learned a ton of a ton of the stuff that that I preach now came from Paul Azinger. Like he's one of the smartest guys that I've ever been around. That's what's so cool about the game of golf, and I think it's changed some now because all the tour players have their entourage and everything around them. But back in the day, even like when I first started getting going, you're a rookie, you're on tour. Yep. Like guys would help other guys out. Yeah. Like, hey, take a look at my swing for a second. Do you see anything? And that's what's so cool about the game of golf that a guy will take you under his wing like that and help him out. But all these feels and stuff you talk about, you're talking about being an athlete, routine and all this. I never hear you once say anything. And technology is a great thing, but I never hear you once say anything about track man, you know, foresight, getting your attack angle this, your spin this. Do you think technology has kind of hurt some of these guys, especially the young kids? Because I feel like every single shot they hit, it's whack and then look at the computer. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, Fax and I had an interesting conversation maybe a month or two ago about this. And his question was basically, 
has all this information, the, the, the dissecting of everything, where is your weight going, this and that, and all this stuff, like how you're attacking the golf ball, what the club face is doing. Has this actually, has this helped players or is, mm-hmm. has it hurt them? Um, there's there's an argument to be made for both. I mean, the, no doubt about it. There, there's some huge advances in technology that has really helped us learn maybe what's optimal. But at the same time, I'll, I'll bring up Keith Mitchell, who um, who's who's talked about it on on the Golfers Journal podcast, where he said, "Look, TrackMan basically says that Keith Mitchell with a driver is not optimized." Now you look at his stats, and you're like, "Dude, you've been top ten on the planet mm-hmm. in driving a golf ball for ten years straight, yeah. but you're not optimized." So now, if he were to go chase optimized with a driver, and that would say you need to hit more up on it, you need to hit it high a high draw with less spin, he he may not be a top 10 driver of the golf ball on the planet anymore. He mm-hmm. may like lose it because that's not sort of his pattern. That's a good point. He might pick up six yards. but He may pick up six yards here or there. Maybe he picks up 15 yards. Maybe he picks up 20 yards. But he's already top 10 on the, on the planet in yeah. driving a golf ball. If he went from like hitting a cut to hitting a high draw to try to chase Rory, he may get up to Rory. But he may also bring in more of this. Mm-hmm by trying to chase optimized. Yeah, don't do that, Keith. Tell me if you agree with this, because like the TrackMan stuff, there is a hundred, there's definitely a good side to it, right? Guys hit their, their clubs, I need the spin to be this, I need my launch to be that, and they chase that perfection, that optimization yep. that you're talking about. What I think, compared to like the old days, prior to all this, is like, guys want to be perfect with everything, right? So they chase that. But then when they get under the gun, it's like, sometimes you just got to get the fucking thing in play. <laughs> and you don't see guys like, take a Lee Trevino. Look at some of the drives he used to hit, like when he was down the stretch. He used to talk about, I just teed it low and hit it as low as I could. It would go it would go less offline if I hit it bad. And like, you just don't see guys, I feel like, hitting like that. This is my go-to shot. I don't care what the numbers are. This thing's going to be forward in play, and yeah. I'm going to be golfing from there. I feel like every, it's kind of like they're just programmed to like hit the perfect, you know, trajectory, the perfect apex with the perfect spin over and over and over. And I feel like there's like less feel or ownership or whatever you want, yeah. whatever word you want. Yeah, to I mean, I think like a, a guy like Minwoo Lee is kind of a throwback, right? He's Love like, him. yeah, he brings in, <laughs> he brings a bit of like new school with also the old school of like, boy, he hits some like low stingers. He hits some like low cuts to make sure he gets it in the fairway. But you can do that when, you, when you've got like 126 club head speed and you can <laughs> yeah. back off of it to 120 and right, hit your fairway finder. Um, but it, 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 at the end of the day, it always comes about like, comes back to finding out what works under the gun, under pressure. Like, are you going to hit something that's like, okay, I'm going to send it this way when you know, like, boy, the miss might be a little bit bigger. And when, if you bring that down to chipping, it's like, well, are you going to go for like the super high spinner here with like wide open club face and get super steep on it just to hit a super spinner? Or are you going to go with a shot that you can predict? Right. And and that's sort of like that's sort of like this whole the, the whole argument that that goes on on social media on like steep and low spinners and versus yeah, um, it's versus ver- heated, <laughs> it's, it got so heated. <laughs> those Twitter streets are mean on that, oh on that, my on that angle of attack. Yeah, it, it got it got it got heated <clears throat> for a while there on, on Instagram. <laughs> Protect your neck who, and who's, Twitter. Who do you think's yelled at you more in the last year? Your wife or Joe Mayo? <laughs> <laughs> Joe and I have had, like Joe and I have been friends for a long time. Like I actually went to see him for my golf swing back in like 2011 or whatever, 2012, to just see if he could help me. Um, but it's a, uh, you know, we've been friends for a long time. I've stayed at his house. We've had we've had whiskeys together and whatnot, um, and we've had long conversations about this exact subject. And it sort of captured the golf world's attention for. Um, for the last six months, right? Like Victor Hovland played really well and it was a great pattern for him. Uh, but when you look at a lot of the stuff that that uh, that the tour players do, the Jason Days, the Steve Strickers, these guys that Matt Kuchers, right? These guys are consistently in the top 10 in strokes getting around the green and they're always finding a way to get their proximity really close to the hole. They're not 15 degrees down with their with their strike, right? They're in the three to eight degrees down with their strike. They're hitting actually the grass before the golf ball, believe it or not, on some of these shots. And so, and these guys, and you go back and you look at their stats and I and I went back and I looked at all their stats and it's like, it's mind blowing how good Stricker was and how good Jason Day was and how good Matt Kuchar is. Um, and then you look at someone like, like if, if I were to bring out Phil Mickelson's name, right? You think like great short game, right? 
you go back and look at his stats, and it actually says that he's mediocre at short game. Well, I would argue that's he, because he's so aggressive. He takes on shots. some crazy he shots that fucks him up. But yeah, like, yeah, and it's, and it's hard to, like, the strokes gain around the green is, is a hard one. It's not a perfect stat. Mm-hmm. But Phil, when you go back and look at the last 15 years, he's closer to, like, between 38th and 70th, whereas Stricker's, like, inside of the top 15 every year. I think the reason people think Phil's is so great, which his short game is incredible, is because he hits – the miracle shot. 100%. Like, yes. The straightforward one doesn't get shown on TV right. every every time, but right. that's one you have to get up and down. Totally. And so, yeah, I think that the, the, this whole debate has been great for like the game of golf in general. It's been great for people to have different opinions on all this stuff. I try to look at it as like, look, it, it, if, if I'm choking my guts out and I've got one shot to hit, I'm going to go with a shot that I, I've got this much margin of error for. Not not one that I've got this much margin of error for, so I, I I choose I choose the one that's a bit more on the shallow side because I think that it does engage the balance. It allows you to have a miss hit and still have a tap in, versus if you are 15 degrees down and you're trying to hit a l- super low spinner, if you miss hit that, you're probably chipping it again. So the answer to that question was Joe Mayo's yelled at you more than your wife over the last year. <laughs> well, you know Joe and I Joe and I have a great relationship, but. Um, but no, we've 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 had like like healthy. We've had you are healthy, dodging the shit out of this question. You should run for president. We've had healthy. Next we've had healthy chef, arguments. Thanks, oh, yeah, yeah. Just be a chef. No, it was re- it was really cool. Like we went to the PGA show and we sat next to each other on this open panel, which was like a, a debate on short game, and it was awesome because it was like in like the coveted like seven thirty time slot, and it was standing room only, and we had a great healthy debate on short game. And and he talked about angle of attack and like how mathematically it was correct. And I'm like, yes, but I also think that you look at Matt Kuchar and he's hitting five degrees down. He's spinning it and he's hitting it low and he's got tons of spin on it. Like there's something missing there where I don't think maybe TrackMan is measuring the numbers quite properly. Um, but I also I also think that if if you're choking your guts out and you are afraid of bad turf interaction, you want to go with something a little more shallow. That's why golf's great, though. Like you, you can totally. try to make it a science, but there's still an art element to it. I don't care who you are, and it's like there's not one way. This is the way you play golf. Look at all the swings yep. over the history, and I, and I, like, and I they're yeah, all and, different. And and in a in certain situations, I think that's a great shot to have, but I don't think that that's the. I don't think that you start there. I think that you start a little bit more neutral, um, and then you work your way to learning how to hit that shot, and you work your way to learning how to hit a high spinner. There, like. Short games, there, there's so many varieties to it. I just think that w- where I am, I think it's like the, the the stuff that I've learned from some of the greats. It's like, yeah, you want you want a little margin of error. Like you go to Vegas, it's like you don't want to be like I'm gonna bet on myself hitting 21 every single time. It's like, no, nah, I wouldn't mind winning with the dealer bus, right? So if the dealer bus in in short game, it's like I'm gonna I'm gonna hit the ground an inch behind it, two inches behind it. The bounce is gonna kick that club up if I'm doing it properly and I'm still going to hit this thing to like three, four feet, that's when the dealer busts. You're like, I miss hit that. I kind of user error, but I still, I still won. Mm-hmm. Right. That's how I would sort of equate it. I, I just think you want to stack your odds in your, in, in your favor. The game of golf is, is too difficult yeah. to try to be like that. Perfect. Hard right. enough as it that's is. Cool. Hard enough, yeah. man. Yeah. I want to make it easier for everybody. Yeah. That's fascinating. Right, the pay-per-view fight coming up soon. <laughs> yeah. Stand by on that. <laughs> Exclusive here. Make sure you go check him out on Instagram, Short Game Chef. Get some cool videos. Let's get to the E9. We could talk about Short Game all day because we all have our issues. Yeah. Um, E9, you're a happily married man. I think we should we should ask this one. I mean, yeah, maybe. this isn't gonna this isn't gonna ruffle any feathers. No. Okay. Okay. I'm ready. We have enough um, to compliment. Yeah. Too. Celebrity crush, whether now or growing up. Ooh, celebrity crush. Boy, I did not expect that one. Um, yeah, usually you guys, usually you guys lead with, uh, like the, the actor yeah, who you, you want to be or whatever. And I had yeah. mine, you know, it was like, all right, Matt- give us your actor too, if you got one. Well, I mean, Matthew McConaughey, like I've definitely been like <laughs> hundred, <laughs> but hundred in the jar. <laughs> you basically look exactly like. No one's ever picked like an ugly actor for them to be like, you know, no, but I, like, I, I get McConaughey and I've gotten Adam Scott and I've, I swear to you, I've signed some autographs as Adam Scott when I was on tour full time, when we were playing in the same event and people would, Adam, you know, Mark, we're going like, to need another jar. Um, no. <laughs> this thing's going to sign Adam Scott, right? Yeah, there you go, kid. Good on you. This one we had like kind of the same like hair in the back. Oh, yeah, a little we had, flat. Sort of had a similar hat. face yeah. structure. Yeah. Both skinny. Yeah. 
All, All right, right, so ce- crush though. Celebrity crush. Um, I, I don't know. I, I'm a, I'm a I'm a J Lo fan. I like Halle Berry. I'm kind of a little more old school. You That's know, perfectly fine. That's fucking great. You're list. stealing, <laughs> <Jesus Christ. laughs> stealing Slitz's girls over here. Got nobody left now. Thank you. No wonder we get along. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, That's yeah. good take. I like All right, I'll take both of those as um, as acceptable answers. All right, as a chef yourself, you could speak on this. Is it true that you got cooked by Barack Obama pickup basketball game in Hawaii? I heard he just diced you up. Um, yeah. He, and did I, you let him? He's actually, yeah. So he, so we played, it was 2000, the, it was 2008. He had not been inaugurated yet, but he'd gotten voted in as president. President elect. End of, yeah, end of 2007, I believe, right? He get, got voted in. Um, or maybe it was, yeah, maybe it was end of 08. So anyway, and he had gotten voted in, but he hadn't been inaugurated yet. And so he, he was playing basketball. My dad was his coach, and so my brother and I got invited to go play a pickup game with sort of his old teammates. Um, and as I subbed in, I happened to sub in for the guy that was guarding him. And so I was like, do I like go hard? Yeah. Right? But there's also secret service. Get, yeah, the sniper will shoot sniper, you in the face. Yes, yeah. 100%. Um, what a way to go. <laughs> it would have been it would have been awesome. True. But I played I played him hard on defense. Um I did not I did not score on him per se. I had a layup but he wasn't guarding me at the time, but I I did not score on him, but I I played him pretty hard on defense. I, I would say that I probably gave up two baskets, which I may I may or may not have been going 85%. You foul. You hard foul. No, I was not like, foul. Oh, I was not you know fouling. What I mean, I just there you go no. right there. I was not going to foul. Yeah, watch your Mr. step. President. Don't forget to use the But he was board. He was so cool, like really. Can he play? He can play. He got buckets on you. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. Play. Once I started to notice he wanted to go left pretty hard, I started shifting him over right. Yeah, but... that's smart. Muscle him up a little bit. Too. <laughs> yeah. Send him right. Yeah. yeah. All right, next one. Phoenix Open this year. You're out there getting your guys ready to go, dialing in the short game. All of a sudden, 150 dudes in chef hats come rolling out. At any moment, did you think they were there to see you coach a little? <laughs> <laughs> I would have. I mean, I yeah, I would like the, the the thing that's been so weird about this whole like chef thing, right? Is that you know I played on the PGA Tour for a handful of years. I won on the PGA Tour, rarely got recognized anywhere, right? And I start this short game chef thing, and I will walk through an airport, and people will say, "Chef," I'm like, "You never recognized me when I was a PGA Tour player, mm-hmm. right?" So I get recognized more for being short game chef than I than I had been for a PGA Tour player. Um, yeah, when I saw those guys, I was like, God, this Minwoo is just taking God, it to is, a, he's taking it to another top. level. Uh, no, it's pretty I, it's pretty cool. I think it's I think it's cool that he's gone with that. I heard today how that all thing. happened, by the way. So I guess Lululemon put out this promotion. They gave like two hundred guys shirt and pants, and they just had and, and the hat obviously, and they just had to go out and cheer on Minwoo. That's genius. For the it is genius. Yeah, just yeah. create a little hype reel. Yeah, we should do some. We should do some uh, collab together. You should like, get him fun. in the kitchen. Yeah, 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 I love that kid. By oh, the way, I would he's just my sit, new favorite guy. By I would the way. sit there and just ask questions. I love like, him. He's, his swing is all his shits. His little stash yeah, is filthy. Yeah. His whole his whole setup. His whole vibe. Primo. And you look at him, and you're like. You, you just look he's at him. And you're like, he's a gonna he's be a, a totally in star. two years. We'll look back and be like, remember when we didn't. Even but you really look know at him much? without without opening his mouth, and you're like, oh, okay, I got it. And then all of a sudden, he opens his mouth. He sounds like exactly like Jason Day, like he's awesome. same tone, same same accent. And you're like, was not expecting that. And that move is sick. Oh. Sidebar question doesn't yep. count as a real question. What else was in the running as as opposed to chef? Did you ever consider any other? You'd be like the yeah. I mean, you know, as I was creating this whole thing, it was like short game wizard, short game guru, short game genius, short game whatever. Like all those sort of things sort of popped into your head, but you're like, no, those are all like very self serving. This one was more like, no, I'm a chef. I'm gonna give you guys all the recipes as to how to get it done around the greens. Got it. It's always been about the people. Yeah, put the hat, put the cook hat on too. You know what I mean? Lean into that shit. Salt Bay, maybe a little bit. Uh, uh, you should. I mean, you should bring I up. Some, yeah, give, the more gimmicky shit you do, the more people will just gravitate to you it. You should bring up the text thread that you, me, and Keith have on the. Oh, you, me, and Keith, have, we've solved the world's problems, dude. We have every idea ever figured out. It's only an ever, hour show, guys. If you ever <laughs> want to go massive? Oh, I forgot to ask you the question. Keith submitted. I'll ask you later. All right, this was a good. This one better for your self confidence. Winning on the PGA Tour as you did, or having your wife voted as hottest wife on the PGA Tour, which you also did. 
Um, that's good. That's a good one. Yeah, no, I, I would I would say the second one is better. Yeah, she's yeah, she's a ten. That's like, still is a ten. That's like the grand slam. Yeah, of cool shit. I'm no, sorry. yeah, I mean, you know? yeah, she beat out Elin. She beat out Amy Mickelson. Like that. That was when, like back in the day, right? Like that was. Those back are people. She, hotter, is that what you're trying to say? Those are the people she was competing <laughs> that was against. Back when there was hot chicks, <laughs> not all these dogs. <laughs> no, yeah. yeah, number one in the official world wife rankings. That's exactly. nice. Yeah, in, in my book, she still is. She's a ten. I love her. God I got I got Chris paired B. with him a lot early on, right when I was getting sponsored. Actually, in the first ever tour event yeah. I played, at Byron Nelson. So. My mom and his wife walked together all the time. I was like, God, you get a tour card? You get a bat? That's, that's pretty good <laughs> game. <laughs> Shit, sign me up. <laughs> she got a sister, too. Yeah, well, yeah, all yeah, right, next question. We better get move on. Tough break now. <laughs> um, you don't want me to tell one? that story? No. Have you, ever been given a sh- have you ever been given a shout-out by the great Bill Walton? Oh, my gosh. This was a great story. So uh, the legendary Jim Decker and I <laughs> go God. to Las Vegas and we go in, we, we're going for the, the Pac-12 tournament, and it's at the MGM, and Jim Decker is a legendary gambler, and so we've got all the VIP things that you can imagine. Jim Decker may or may, or may not have won a handful of money at, at the blackjack table. I had to pull him away to go to dinner. I was like, look, you're up a lot. Let's go to dinner. So he's like, we go to dinner. He's like, thank you for pulling me away. So then we go to the game. They've got like three games in a row, and so we go, we're going to go catch the last two games. We go down and we're sitting courtside, feet on the floor, and Bill Walton is literally from me to Stoltz, from away from Decker, right? And Decker's like, yo, he's like, I know Bill Walton. Like, I was like, I know you know Bill Walton, but Bill Walton does not know you. Yeah, there's a big difference. <laughs> he's like, no, 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 actually, Bill Walton knows me. I was like, he does not know you. So sure enough, Decker says, you know, th- th- there's breaks and Bill Walton's taking his headset off and he's standing up and he says, Decker says, hey, Bill. Jim Decker. I was at the Michael Jordan uh, fantasy camp 12 years ago. Do you remember me? <laughs> Do you remember me? I had the sick crossover. Yeah. And he's like, it was up, it was up in camp, you know, and, and and he's like, oh, he's like, Decker, he's like, lefty. Yeah, yeah, you had a great bank shot. And I don't know if Bill Walton really remembered this or not, but it was like Decker, it made Decker's life, right? And he's and so anyway, Bill uh, Decker says, look. Here's Parker. He played at UCLA, and Bill's like, "Oh, great to meet you. You know, play on the PGA Tour. It's great, UCLA Bruin." So anyway, they come back from commercial. The cameraman's sitting courtside, and he, Walton, tells the producer, "Like, hey, we want to start talking about these two guys that are sitting courtside. Nothing's going on with Washington versus Washington State." <laughs> so the cameraman turns to us, and he's like, "Yo, Bill's talking about you guys." So turns out that Bill says, "Look." I, I got to get the camera on these two guys. This Jim Decker, he's the greatest thing since Steve Nash. He never made it, but he had the great little left-hand floater oh off the glass. God. And he starts telling, and, and he says, like, Decker's like, it's life is made, right? He's watching Bill Walton from me to you talk about how great he is in this <laughs> basketball. Jordan basketball camp. <laughs> it's like the lefty floater was to die for, and he should have made it, you know, next greatest thing since Steve Nash. Then he goes over to me, and he's like, oh, Parker McLaughlin, he's UCLA. He's one of the great golfers out of UCLA. Meanwhile, I'm like 19th on the list of greatest golfers ever out of UCLA. But you know how Bill Walton does it. But it was one of those highlights where you're like, if ever somebody could talk about you, it would be you would want that's, it to be Bill Walton because he just takes it to the next level, and it's one of those moments where Decker and I just we always laugh about it. It's one of the great. Stories. I heard there was a little more to that story where there could have possibly been an incident with a USC player. <laughs> <laughs> Decker was getting in that guy's head big time. Oh, he almost yeah. I mean, he almost got thrown out. This guy almost came over and punched Decker. Like, and then y'all ran into him at the casino, but he didn't recognize Decker. <laughs> yeah, exactly. God. Decker's like, hide me. That's awesome. Hard to believe. Oh, uh, some legendary stories. Oh my God! Yeah, Jim. De- that was in like the prime. That was primo prime Decker Jim Decker. Era, yes. By the way, yes, he's toned um, down since then. All right, my next one. Let's see. All right, just give me. You used to live with Ricky Barnes, one of your closest friends in the world. Give me the worst traits of Rick as a roommate. Oh, break God. down Rick as a as a living oh. partner. Wow, it's been it's been a, it's been a, a minute. Rick, I think you'd be pretty damn good. Yeah. I tell you what, R- Ricky makes a sneaky good breakfast. Right, like he cooks the eggs, scrambled eggs, perfectly, low and slow. Like he's one of the legends at cooking breakfast. He he's always making bacon. Right, you look at you look at his physique, and you're like, dude, he's everything. Like he's perfect. Like yes, eating. Yeah, 
And so he um, he's a great breakfast maker. He's always up early. Mm. Even after a big night out, dude's first one up making breakfast. Yeah. Um, I don't know if he's, he's a talk fake drinker. He's, he's I've, seen him, I've seen him go drinker. for real. Of course he's oh, he goes really. for real. He can send it. And he always has everything. He's like, hey, dude, I need, does anyone have a Band-Aid, a paper clip, and a ball of yarn? He's like, yeah, what, what size Band-Aids do you want? Like, he travels with everything. It's um, like MacGyver. We call him 7-Eleven because like, even all the shit. on the golf course, right? Dude, I'm hungry. Oh, what, what do you want? I got a you bar. I've got, I've got. A, I have old fillet that I just. Uh, <laughs> I've got jerky. He always has jerky on him. Oh, jerky. Cake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he has, he has, he's got uh, 19 different snacks in his golf bag. We used to call him snacks because he'd have 19 snacks in his bag. So um, I don't know if there's a. I don't think he had like a bad trait. I think like he's he was, probably solid. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He was always. Weird... And the rent was the rent was the right price. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, he was a great. He's a great room. Yeah, he nobody has more shit with them at all times than Ricky yeah. Barnes. No, get, no, no. If you get bored on the golf course, need a Sudoku. He's got oh, one. He just crosswords just like crosswords in between shots. That. I'm like, yeah. what are you doing? We're partners in New Orleans. We're walking down the fairway in the tournament. And he's yeah. doing a crossword Sudoku. I'm like, are you kidding me? It's a fact. It's so yeah, good. yeah, like a hundred year old man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's great. All right, next one. <laughs> What's a better hangover cure? Liquid IV or Dr. Dre's famous song, "The Next Episode." <laughs> Another good story. Um, yeah, so I was down visiting Ricky Barnes at, at U of A, and I was at, UC, at UCLA, and we had had a night the night before, um, and it was an unbelievable night, and, and we just went full tilt. Uh, we get up the next morning, we're supposed to go to the football game together, and I am just like, Ricky, I would puked like how many times? And I was just like, I, I, I can't do it, man. I can't do it. He's like, here's some Gatorade, you know, just... You, you'll be all right. You'll be fine. And I was like, Gatorade wasn't working. It was coming back up. So anyway, he just says, he, he says, look, man, he's like, the game's about 30 minutes from now. Like we got good seats. We got to go. And he throws on some Dr. Dre. He cracks open a Coors light. And it was like, let's go. I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> and we sent it. <laughs> Said it was like that WWE guy, or whatever. That just popped like he's dead, and then he just yeah. Uh, as soon as like next up, he's like, dude, he just popped up like someone had just given him a shot. No. Like, oh yeah, whatever, weekend, weekend at Bernie's, dead. dead. Music yeah. comes on, bam. Like, oh, you know what? I was I'm here. I was dead out on the couch, and Ricky got up at six as he does, goes out, goes to Seven Eleven, gets a bunch of snacks and stuff. He's like, hey, get in my bed. So I got in his bed, and I was like, I'm gonna be out for the day. Sure enough, he puts on some Dre, and we were like, let's go. I was Beautiful. up and mm-hmm. ready to go. Yeah, He's a good little, like, caretaker. You oh, know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. He knew, yeah, he knew just he the knew right exactly the recipe yeah. for the chef to get you back up. All right, my last one for me. Is it true you tried to come back to UCLA for a fifth year when you found out that the golf team would be posing nude for Golf Digest? I heard you tried to slide back in. It would have actually been my sixth year, yes. And <laughs> I would have. So you could I, be a doctor. I would have. Yeah, the, the picture with the golf balls right here. Yeah, I feel like that's you, dude. Re- yeah, I was really disappointed that I was not part of that because I was like, yeah, I, I felt like I raised those guys, right? I was like the only senior. There was no juniors on the team. I was the only senior, and there was a bunch of sophomores and freshmen. And so I was like, man, I like I raised these guys. We're in the gym. We're all getting yoked together. Sure enough, the next year they're on the cover of whatever. And I'm like, I know. God, I missed that. I forgot about think that. With that yeah, yeah, remember that? I think with that kid a lot. Who was it? It was like Merrick, Travis, Travis Johnson. Johnson Travis yep. TJ was in that yep. thing. Yep. Uh, I can't remember like the young kids or whatever. But I was like, that thing came out and it was like, what the? I was like, <laughs> UCLA is wild. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they had the range balls over their nuts. <laughs> I mean, right. get, I mean yeah, the different the only difference, fans they would have popped off. The nowadays. difference from when I went to college of like what golf was looked at when I went to college was like ni- 97, right? And so Tiger had just kind of come on the scene. Golf was still kind of like yeah. nerd, you're a nerd yeah. if you play golf. Then all of a sudden Tiger wins and it's like, whoa, golf's kind of cool. And then by the time I leave five years later, and these guys are on the cover of whatever golf digest looking like naked with golf balls in front of them, it was like wow like look at where golf has come like these guys are real athletes so it's like it made a huge shift from year one to year five yeah after 97 for sure yeah all right next one there's gonna be some math involved here so Mm. put that ucla brain to work right here Mm. what's a larger number okay the margin of victory for you at reno tahoe or the number of penalty strokes you took on the seventh hole at quail hollow uh, I'm gonna go penalty strokes. Yeah, so that's a good story. Carry the one. 
So the the seventh hole at Quail Hollow, uh, dog leg left, par five, and I was working on like I was always a little low kind of healy cutter. And this hole never set up well for me, but I was working on something in my swing to try to hit this like high draw. And I was just determined, right? It was like mid part of the year. And I was like, I've been working on this for like five, six months. Like this should be ready to go. And I, and I hit this thing and it just go over to the right. And there's water there. Now it's, it's a water hazard, but then beyond the water hazard is out of bounds. It's a, it's a guy. Rather yard. nice houses. Really nice Big houses. <laughs> yeah. Like I'd love to be friends with those people. And so anyway, so I, I hit this shot and it looks like it goes in the water. So I'm walking up there. I think I was paired with, um, Martin Laird and Stuart Appleby. So I, I walk up there and we get all the way up to the water. I was like, is this all right to drop? And and I can't remember which one said it, but they were like, actually, I think it went over the water and it's in their house. It's out of bounds. And I was like, could have told me this on the tee. Yeah, yeah, this on the tee. Like, before I walked three yeah, yards. Yeah. yeah. So now they're like, you're going to have to go back. I call a rules official. He's like, yeah, I mean, if they think it went over there, it's you got to go back. So my caddy, Don Donatello, legend of a caddy, he he grabs my driver and three golf balls and leaves the bag there. And we ride back. So much confidence in his man. <laughs> He's bringing a sleep. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> just a guess. Just a guess. This is great. Uh, we ride back to the tee box. And already in the tee box was Davis Love and Ryu Jimata. Now, Granted, Davis Love was probably like one of the guys I idolized growing up. And I remember the first time I played with Davis and he hit this three iron off a tee that went like like a, like my nine iron on like 235, 240 hole. And I was like, I can't pull the trigger. Like I I don't, I, I had to hit after him. I was like, I can't. So anyway, I already had this thing on Davis Love. I was like, I can't even. So now I'm hitting three off the tee with Davis watching me. Hit the exact same shot <laughs> into this guy's backyard. I was like, give me another ball. Tee it up again. Hit the exact same shot. Give me another ball. Don, again, like 10 cup. He's like, look, this so is the back. last ball I have. The other balls are in the bag. You better hit this in play. Oh, my God. So anyway, so I, I hit this one in play. I get up. I end up, I end up making a 13 on the hole, <laughs> right? 13, eight over par on this hole. Not a, it's not a difficult par five. It's one of the easier par fives. I mean, it, it, there's trouble, but there's yeah, trouble, they but eat it a lot. Yeah, guys eat it a lot. And so I make a 13 on this hole. This the guy carrying our sign felt so bad for me, right? He just removed both of the numbers off of this blank. <laughs> this, yeah, the McLaughlin standard bear. Blank. Yeah, just blank. So people were like, yeah, I could hear him as I was walking up there. Like, I wonder what he is for the day. Like, he's not even. <laughs> it's not even on there. Anyhow, I shoot like oh, I must have shot like 88 that day. It was a it was a bad day. It was probably one of the lowest, like lowest days of golf that I had ever had. And I love that tournament. I love that golf course. I had like played well there previously, but I was going through this whole swing thing and it was like, I could not find like which way the golf ball was going. Um, so yeah, a little 13 on, on number seven there. It's beautiful. So that, it sounds like, yeah. Yeah. I, so, yeah eight over well, on that hole. Sorry, one, two, but six penalty so six shots. Six penalty, penalty shots. shots. So I won by more. seven. You I won by, by a touchdown. Yeah. Right. That is yeah. incredible. I love that he took a <laughs> sleeve of balls back to the tee. That's my favorite part of the story. But Parker, man, congrats on everything. This was uh, this was awesome to sit down with you. Um, keep up the great work. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah. We're, uh, we're doing, you know, I feel like we're doing good stuff for the, for the people. Like I, I launched this website, shortgamechef.com, and we're just we're, we're trying to get people like just to understand how fun the short game can be, and that's always been my whole motto. And so it's been a fun sort of transition from playing to now teaching, and and I get a kick out of seeing people get better. Love. If they need some help, this is the man right here. Come <laughs> see the chef. Appreciate you, my man. Thanks, boys. Got it. All right, that was the short game chef Parker McLaughlin joining us. Can't believe how disappointed he was when all those people showed up at Phoenix Open in the chef hats. Thought they were for him. <laughs> like, oh my, this is just taking off. Yeah. I knew it was. I knew Instagram was was powerful. But uh, dude, he's made a nice move from like playing, you know, one on the PGA Tour, kind of hovering around, getting X amount of starts per year, and then boom, like taking off with the short game stuff. He's got tons of people around, and he's got the way he teaches it is great. That's why I really like getting into this stuff with A Zinger because he actually took me down to spend a few days with Zinger, and to this day is like that's probably the most valuable few days of golf instruction 
that I've ever had. And he's taking that and running with it and adding his own, adding his, his own stuff to it. Yeah, look, I know a lot of our listeners suck at chipping. Probably got the yips. Parker can help you out. So yeah. definitely go look him up, um, book a lesson with him, and, and he'll help you. Let's go back real quick to the players. Because one thing we forgot to touch on, a full field event yeah. with a cut. I mean, we've been very adamant about this. We don't like the limited field, no cut events. They, they, I feel like they kind of run stale. There's not that much excitement until possibly the weekend if we do get a really bunched leaderboard. But this week, 144 guys, a cut. We saw a guy jump off to a five-shot lead, and then some of the best players in the world, I think we had number three, six, and nine or ten. Yeah, it wasn't like a lot of Cinderella stories on no. this leaderboard. And this is what we want. But you have to have a large field with a cut, so you can get that leaderboard bunched. And I mean, there was we couldn't ask for anything more other than possibly if we would had a three Maybe or four the playoff. man playoff. Yeah, if, there yes. were four, if all four of those dudes could have had a three hole playoff, like that would have been the dream scenario. But we were damn close to, it. and it's by far and away the most entertaining, best event on the PGA Tour this year, and maybe in a long time, actually. But this is my whole deal with these signature events. Like they're great because all the best players have to play. But just give us a hundred, give us one twenty, cut it to sixty. I don't care. Just get it in there where we have a full field where Thursday, Friday matter, and they have to earn their way to Saturday and Sunday. And I promise you there is going to be a much more bunched leaderboard and a lot more drama coming down the stretch on Sunday. Yeah, it just kind of goes like contrary to what they preach. We're like, this is our flagship event. This is the biggest event on the PGA Tour that the PGA Tour runs, period, bar none. It's the players. And they're like, oh, yeah, for that, we're going to have 144 guys and we're going to cut. Mm -hmm. But then it's like, here's our other signature event. We're going to have half of that and no cut. Or maybe yeah. 10 dudes are going to get cut max. Like, it, I was like, why wouldn't why would you stick with the blueprint for what's your marquee event, you know, throughout the year? Why do you got to switch it? And I'm with you, dude. I think 120 is kind of a, a nice number. Not, that cut, Chop it in half, boom, and 60 people, bam, you got a night. And it's still going to be hard to do. But there's so many guys outside the top 70 that potentially change their careers and are good enough to go and contend or win these things that just don't get a shot to play in most of them. Look, 120, you have no problem finishing with daylight. You can tee off nine, and, one and 10 like you always do. I just think it's a no-brainer. And also, like I said, it gives, maybe not Thursday, but it gives Friday some juice. If you sit there and you see Roy McIlroy has got a birdie one of his last four to like be around for the weekend. Like I think it interests the viewer at home. Yeah, and there were some big names that didn't play the weekend this week. But is it a better tournament if they're going off super early on Saturday, you know, way ahead of the four hours before? The, like, does that change anything? Like, they don't show no. one shot on TV. They don't because, see one shot on yeah. TV. Maybe if you're on property, like, oh, I get a chance to see this guy hit a couple of shots. But, like, it doesn't, in my opinion, make the golf tournament any better. Like, it comes down to the guys at the top. And the more guys you get in the field, the better chance I think you have a, of having a – Finish like we had this past week. 100%. And also, if you noticed, it wasn't a shotgun start. It was not. If there was a shotgun there was tea start, time. imagine that shit. There was tea happen. times through. I saw you lob that tweet out yeah, on Twitter. Just, I was like, here we go. I'm chum, bored. Chum the waters. Yeah. There I go. I'm Swim bored. up to the We're boat. Have a little fun yeah. with it. I knew that would stir some shit up. All right. Well, let's move on to the Valspar Championship, one of the most underrated golf courses on the PGA Tour. Innisbrook, Copperhead. It's a hard sum of bitch. Taylor Moore is your defending champion. Shot 10 under last year to win. I love that. It was concrete. More of these. I was there. It was freaking so firm. It was awesome to watch. This is what we want. Hopefully no rain this week, and I would expect the winning score to be very similar. Yeah, I mean, we got 20 at the players. I'd love to see that chopped in half this week. Yeah, I mean, they had zero win the for the most Thursday part. Thursday when I looked up at the – Thursday was like the only day I didn't watch almost every shot, and I was like, God, yeah. this thing, they're killing. And yeah. balls were spinning back in the afternoon. Yeah. It just wasn't, it didn't, wasn't bouncy. All right, get some wind, get some heat. That place will get very, very difficult. And I'm going to go with my favorite. It's going off at 12 to 1, so it's not really going out on a limb. I'm not taking Xander Schauffele, who's the massive favorite. But this guy's won here twice. He's coming off 12 cuts in a row. Had a great Saturday at the Players. Struggled a little bit on Sunday, but I know he loves this golf course. I it just It's so perfect for him. Give me Sam Burns. Sam Burns. Yeah, good pick. This is, a I think, a good, like, Horses for courses type of golf course. You look at the guys that have won here. It's like straight drivers, typically good iron players. You know, Kevin Streelman's had big success here. Taylor Moore fits that mold. I'm going with the same type of a guy. A little further down than you, but he's 22 to 1 coming off a monster week. Was one of those one of those four guys we talked about just one shot short of that playoff at the players. But uh, give me Brian Harmon. Mm. Kids rolling right now. Hits it straight. Great iron player. Putter always works, it seems like. So I'm going to ride the hot hand. With B. Harm. Should be a, I mean, most golf courses are good for Brian Harmon. Yeah. But a firm, fast in this brook will be really good. Players, too. Like, that's a great it's just, type of golf course. My whole deal with that is, like, can he keep it going for Maybe, another week? Yeah. Because it took so much. He shot an even par on Thursday and then got hot, had a hot plate the rest of the week and almost ended up getting in there. It was fun to watch B. Harm battle it out. He is not scared. 
Mm -mm. I love, love that. Love watch and he hits it like normal human. Like it's fun to watch Wyndham hit three iron pitching wedge on 18, but like you can't really relate to that. But when Harmon, who's not short by the way, but it's more like, all right, that's regular human type stuff. And yet he still yeah. finds a way to get it done. 168 ball speed. Yeah, like normal shit. Yeah, not yeah, compared to 191. All right, my dark horse going off at 60 to 1. Hmm. Had top five club throws in the history of golf last week. Yeah. I think he good. got it. I think he got it's it out good. of the way. And he's gonna be ready to rock this week. 60 to 1, past champion, mm -hmm. Adam Hadwin. Yep, love that. Horses for courses, past champ, great setup for him, and impeccable. Very un Adam Hadwin like, by the, the way. The form was beautiful. It was good. Just roll middle of the green, rolling left, rolling left, soup, chuck. That's what that golf course does to you. Uh, it was beautiful. All right, I'm going just slightly further down the board here. This one cold. If this one hits, this one's gonna make me look smart as shit. 65 to 1. Okay, coming off a very nice week, 16th at the players, two wins on the PJ Tour. Doesn't get a lot of love, a little bit under the radar, but love his golf swing. Extremely simple, and when he gets it going, it's good enough to win. Give me Sepp Straka. Oh, big ox from Austria. Awesome. Good day, it. mate. By the way, still, yeah, yeah, exactly. I still don't believe he's from Austria with that accent. I mean, he sounds more Southern than Kevin Kisner. Yeah, when he's on the year, like, eh, it just kind of throws a wrench in the whole thing. When you got, like, Shane Lowry talking to Sepp Straka. Y'all like, are from Olay. the same, y'all are the same <laughs> continent, are you? Cool. <laughs> no, but I, I love it. Great caddy, Dewey, yeah. on the back. Pound for pound, largest player caddy combo out there. Pound for pound, the most pounds. The most pounds. Is that where you're going? That's where I'm going. Yeah, okay. Pound for pound. But I like it. They have the most. I like them. it. All right. Big step. Yeah. All right. Well, that's going to do it. Everybody enjoy the Valspar Championship, and we'll talk to you on next week's Subpar.